Γεια σα. Hello. Um, we don't have a translation, so this uh, conversation is going to be in English. My name is Elena Kunduri. I'm the director of Neon Foundation. And this is our artist, uh, Adrian Villarojas, who transformed the National Observatory of Athens. Welcome here today. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you for joining us in this uh, talk. Thank you, Kalispera. Um, one little thing, since we are using this tool called English, uh, and it's very clear, I mean, I'm Argentine, she's Greek, and we have all these weird accents and accents. Uh, accents. Uh, please be f feel free to stop me or her, I don't know, and ask if whatever we are saying makes sense. Um, it's interesting because I never thought of it's when you, I don't know, my mother used to send me to English classes and she was like, and I, I was quite annoyed because I, in Argentina you have a pretty good, like back then, I'm pretty old, but uh, back then you, and even before uh, entering the educational system in Argentina, we had a pretty good public run by the state education program, but English is always something you have to go and learn somewhere else, so to a private institution. So you go and your parents send you to study English. And in my case, I was pretty annoyed because of course, perhaps I wanted to, I don't know, draw or watch cartoons. But my mother always said like, uh, because I asked her why I have to go and you know learn English. And she's like, it's for the future. I was like, okay, whatever. But um, what I'm trying to say with this is like, I never thought so deeply about this until very recently, how instrumental for artists that perhaps don't, that don't, do not come from, let's say the first world economies to have this tool called English. How many amazing artists perhaps cannot articulate, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm not amazing, but I, and I don't, I'm not very sure I can articulate what I do with English, but how use, useful, but also complicated to have access to is this tool we call English, right? Like, I don't know, it's like something that puzzles me because it took me many years to kind of get to a moment of uh, using English as something close to what I, I would normally do with Spanish. And I went to, high school, primary school, university, I read books, I watched films, I had it, an education, but there were my first years and, and perhaps after 2011 when I was somehow dropped into what one would call like the art world or the international art world, it took me a long time to, to find my own words again. So, I, mean, I don't know, it's good to question why we use this tool, right, called English, and it's good. I'm, I'm sure many things I will say won't make perfect sense, so please stop me. I, was, I will talk about me, about myself, my use of English, and, um, and ask again if I don't make any sense. It may, I may not make any sense even though I explain again. And then the other thing is like, please ask questions, because maybe it's nice to, since we have this beautiful parking lot, <laughs> and this beautiful light and temperature, um, let's use it. So if someone has a question, we don't need to wait, because in the end, at, at the end of the talk, no one wants to talk. And we get all very shy. So if someone has a question, shoot the question whenever you want. I don't know, what do you think, Elina, I'm just... I think you made the perfect uh, introduction of the complexity of your ideas and the layers in which you think, uh, not only on the projects, but the way you relate with people and with words and uh, with your environment. And uh, since you use the English language and how it has affected the way you use the construction of the words, uh, I wanted to ask you about a word that it's uh, embedded in uh, your work, which is negotiation, and how this word is, uh, you use it as a tool, but also it comes out in every project you do. And uh, this is something that we have encountered here at the National Observatory when you first saw the actual building. This was like the first negotiation that was made when Sinas negotiated the building of uh, the first observatory in 1846, an act that was totally absurd for the time when Athens had only 12,000 inhabitants as a population. And then uh, you come 160 years later and you negotiate this place again. <clears throat> yeah, this question had like has been. Be, I mean, like now that you're talking about like I, I uh, it's quite interesting to think about like this place being one of the or the most high-end 
um, a cosmological entity for research in Europe in 1846 for 12,000 people in a city that was very recently recovered from the Ottoman Empire, right? Like, uh, I think uh, the place now looks so innocent, <laughs> but it's incredibly loaded because if you think two seconds about like why do we need to investigate and research about the, the, the cosmos when we have barely a city, it tells so much about also what we've been trying to do with the, the project in other layers and perhaps with the mainly in, in I mean, I would say in, in the whole in the whole space, but perhaps it's more clearly ex expressed in the vitrines, but perhaps we go there later. But this is the fact that um, it fascinates me on how throughout uh, the digging here that happened because of archeolo archeological digging and recovery of the Greek and Roman past, the cleansing of the Ottoman Empire traces happened. So this dynamic, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, but anyways, we're talking about negotiations. I mean, there are many negotiations over there, but um, I, I coined this term that I call the, the, the phallic approach to installation making. I, I, one could say that this person here is kind of a, an installation artist uh, that usually does these like big, 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 huge, crazy projects, which is something I criticize myself a lot about. I think a lot about why, why I do these, these things. Um, and when I think about this uh, breed or this uh, department in contemporary art, the installation artist, the artist that, it's a horrible phrase what I'm going to say, the, the artist that pushes the boundaries of the institutions. <laughs> it's like, uh, I think many times it's done throughout what I call the phallic approach, which is the artist comes, he, she, and nobody imposes some sort of crazy plan. Usually, what happens then is that the artist leaves and leaves also, I mean, leaves the room, leaves the, any negotiation, negotiational arena you can think of. And the curator, the assistance of the curator, the institution, or whomever is hosting the project, and the assistance of the, the artist, and perhaps the gallerists of the artist, are left in the most like insane anxiety fever you can imagine because they have to realize the dream of the artist. Like the artist said, I want corn, I want 11 vitrines, I want these caves open to public, to the public uh, or public use uh, or this or that. So what I think I'm trying to do very hard is, uh, is to negotiate. So <clears throat> in this re regard, the container generates content. This is another thing that, that came to my mind very recently when, when I was questioning why I do this thing. And what it means that the container bring, brings content, it means that the container has an opinion. In this case, the National Observatory. In any other case, could be a museum, or it can be a gallery, or it can be a park. But this container emancipates decisions, too. So everything you're seeing here in this project, and, and actually everything you see when, I, when you see one of my projects happens throughout this process of negotiation. I also use this term like I, 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 I try to become a parasite. So the parasite is received and stays. It's, it has some temporary permanency. So for many, many months, I, with the, my team and Neon's team, we became a part of the fabric of the infrastructure of the observatory. So when you do that, when you do this, this uh, you move in this logic, you get to understand, hopefully, this is, I guess, what I do, you read the institution, you read the space, you read the, because <laughs> in this case, it's an institution, I mean, but anyways, you read how the politics of this space work, whichever space holds you, and if you, do some good readings, that's a moment where you can push these supposedly so-called boundaries. But they, they only happen, I think, throughout, I mean, happen healthy throughout nego negotiations. And when we did the, the press conference, I think I received one of the best compliments I ever received. And Manolis, the director of the observatory, said that because of the project, because of what we did here, the observatory, 
people working here, because the observatory is nothing, right? Like people working here learned more about the space, about their space. So this is what I would call the healthy, dynamic ecology of how to work. In this uh, space, though, in terms with other projects that you have done, it has this uh, unique, let's say, symbiotic relationship that happened. It's an institution which is a functioning institution. It hosts the Geodynamic Institute of Athens, the Meteorological Institute. There are 60 people working in a completely different field. And somehow, a private institution coexisted with an artist that came from uh, abroad with his team and tried to create this uh, universe and this dynamic, which is a metamorphosis that happened gradually, but in a very concise and dynamic uh, way. And you explored, this is why I think people also, they have learned uh, to coexist with others in a completely different way. And you have explored places inside the observatory that nobody has ever visited. Yeah, in that, in that regard, I, I, I have to say one more thing about like the, the scale. When I'm like, you know, late at night or early in the morning or whenever, I'm like, why I'm doing these huge things? Actually, we had this, this um, conversation with, with Dimitri. I remember, when was it? Like some five months ago, he was like, why? He asked me, why? <laughs> and I asked myself a lot about why. I have to say that I found this, I found this other equation, which is, the scale of the pro I mean, the project itself is a measuring device. Uh, what this project is measuring is the amount of connect connectivity we had with the institution. So the bigger the project, the more complex the project, the more you were able to communicate your desires, the more you were able to have these like uh, fluxes of ideas. So the more, perhaps, the healthier the project it is in those terms. Um, that, that brought some ease to my mind, I have to say. But I'm um, talking about, like what? Like finding the caves. Yeah. What do we want to say about that? I like what you say on the phrase that when you were leading down the path uh, that was completely barren even before you reached the caves, that you had this moment of thinking, should they cross this line or not? And this is something that troubled you, because you sense that if you cross this line, then you have to see what you're going to do with this uh, space if you encounter it. And it was uh, completely uh, a physical activity to reach there, and it was completely isolated from the rest of the observatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I've been doing the last five years some sort of like film work, and I, when I was having these meetings with the, the editor, uh, of all my films, and this person works and operates within the film field, so she has nothing to do with contemporary art, but she told me the thing which I absolutely save in my most treasured like uh, ideas. She said uh, to me, when, when a director comes to me to, with the material this person has been filming, he comes with 80 hours of traumatized, we are Argentines, so we like these words, like traumatized <laughs> material. And I have to transform this material, bring peace to this material, and turn it into maybe a 60 minutes movie or one hour, I mean, a one hour 10 movie or 30 minutes uh, short film. And to do so, the first time I see something, it's incredibly important. I need to be alone, I need to be in, in peace. And, and I need to, and this is the moment where I take my, my notes because I am absolutely ignorant. I know nothing about the project. So this person has like this very um, strict loss on how we work. So she never wants to know what I did, what I thought, what, I, what were my, the concepts, where I should, nothing. She only sees the material. So when I came here, I, I was quite preoccupied because it's cl clearly a very beautiful place, yes. But I was like, where do we place the art? whatever thing is art, but I, I was like, wh what, what to do with this place? And clearly, I'm supposedly a, a sculptor. I guess we, I was coming out of the Istanbul Biennale project, so there was some, let's say, animosity towards maybe we will have some, some nice looking sculptures. We had the Gennadius Library pre uh, precedent, which, was, which, which resonated, of course, resonated very well in Athens. 
because had this, this, there were these some left, leftovers of a project I did for the previous document <coughs> in <coughs> 2012. So these were very figurative, ruined looking like sculptures. So people, Athenians, I guess Greeks, whomever saw it here, found them quite appealing. So we had like this equation going around and I was working in, in this space in the observatory and looking at these little, I mean, medium-sized patches of land that back then were quite dead. So what you're seeing now very green was quite brownish. And I was like, am, am I supposed to plant sculptures here? And I, and I was like, I, I was not very happy with that plan. <laughs> so I start to walk around and then I saw the museum, which is a, the, the architecture is a quite interesting one. Um, but also was quite preoccupied about the layout of the museum in terms of its museology. So I was like, I felt quite trapped. I was like, where do I run? And walking around here, when I got to this side, which leads to what we call the, I mean, the nickname would be the war zone, don't tell anyone. And, um, and the pathways, these cemented pathways that are very clearly the places where we should be walking end. So when I reached that, that moment in the space, in the layout of the space, I decided to keep on walking, but there was nothing. It was only dirt, and, and as probably some of you experienced, when you reach to the, the end of this pathway, nothing really tells you that there will be something more. We don't know how, what, when was the last time that there was some activity there, if there was some activity. I guess we are assuming there some, was- Some illegal activity. Some illegal evenings. or some, some, illegal some fun. Some fun, people was having some fun. <laughs> Let's not <laughs> give any entity to these activities, but- um, so when I'm, this is, um, let's say, what I wanted to recover for the project. That moment of looking for something, in this case, let's say looking for art. Where is art? Is the corn art? I mean, these are very stupid <laughs> things, right? But um, I'm, I guess my fascination with like creating environments comes also in hand with this idea of alienating the experience of the perception of art. So supposedly, the, the thing that looks more like art is these vitrines, because they are codified like, again, vitrines. They are protecting something, that's something we shouldn't touch, something we should admire. So the codes are very clear there. But of course, there's a big, let's say, displacement, because the, let's say the, how, how could I say, can I say, the, the geography of the space is not very codified. So. On one side, you have objects that are codi very easily codified as art, but the, the, place, the place that holds the things is not, let's say, where you should find these vitrines, to put it in a very, very stupid way. So I was quite interested in, in audiences recovering this feeling of uh, not finding, not finding, not finding something, and finally s encountering something that perhaps articulates the whole experience. But not this, the way you wanted to articulate this by not finding or getting yourself lost, even now if somebody comes and walks into the observatory, the way you have planted and you have created the whole environment, it's a seamless uh, coexistence. And unless you really look through the photos on the leaflet or the catalogs of what you, how the observatory used to be uh, before 2017 and your intervention and the stages the long process that it took to reach this environment, this could be something that it's not about finding as well, like the plantation. Yeah, well, this is, this is an, another aspect of uh, what I do that I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to explore more and more, which is the, the non-art, non-visible non art things that I do. And this is something we discuss a lot. Like, up to, uh, up to what extent give information to the audience and create uh, an awareness that we have done things. Honestly, everything that you see inside there that doesn't respond to, of course, the, lay, the, the, the architecture of the space have been touched and modified. But I'm, I'm eager and I welcome the audience that will come without knowing that we have done something. And I'm, I'm very happy with this encountering with a a museum that perhaps is a productive museum in terms of uh, food production, perhaps. A green museum in a moment of the city where it's a very dry season. 
So I'm interested in this confusion, and I welcome these misunderstandings. I think the moment, the moment the confusion and the contradictions and the miscommunication ends, the moment the signifiers crystallize so clearly, is the moment a, re a relationship with your audience or with the field is dead. Like, I mean, I, I, I will eventually have been processed and accepted by some parts of the system, this art system, and eventually I will be also digested and pooped. So the only way you can resist this logic of the system, because the system always, always wants new and new and fresher and fresher, uh, is to create these moments of contradiction, these moments of confusion, to keep active these discussions. So yes, the, the non-art or the art is not present is something I'm, I'm very preoccupied because I think, um, let's say, there's nowhere to run by no means. I mean, there's nowhere to run. I, I, I have this theory of the post Duchampian moment. I don't think there's much more to do after Duchamp. And then if you start to look more in depth, perhaps after Egyptian pottery, there shouldn't even be Art Nouveau. So this exhaustion of the system is something I'm very interested in. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the morning, morning of art. So I'm, I'm interested in the presence of art. What, what preoccupies me or generates, to my taste, the most interesting question is like, why we are still interested in this thing we call art and what art does, how art manifests, which are ontological inquiries. So I, I don't think the only really, to my, it is my very personal opinion, my focus is on, it's an ontological focus. The only way to create really big displacements in the field is through undermining the, the, ontologi the ontological questions. By acting, though, the way you acted in this environment is a total undermining of how somebody, at least at the, even the vitrines in this outside the museum, is something which undermines these questions, and or planting or making a silent museum inside and getting out all the museological artifacts that used to exist? Well, we, I think, talking about planting, the gesture of planting here has been a quite complicated one. It, I come from a country where we've been taught that dirt has nothing more than, let's say, the capacity to be fertile. This is what I've been taught. I was born in this system where like our, the dirt below the feet of Argentines has no content. It only generates products, goods, food. So it's interesting how we arrived to Athens and I had this plan of planting and all of a sudden for planting, because I, I came very naively, we did a very proper research and we know very well that, <coughs> that by 1846, this was only rocks. This place had no dirt. But um, there's a, a political entity in Greece that has to protect the, the content of dirt and has to protect the possibility of a particular, a private, a person, an individual to dig. So for planting, and this came, came out to, I mean, created a quite interesting uh, formal aspect of the plantation here. We had to add something like 40 to one meter more of soil. dirt, soil, and elevate the ground level. So to plant, you have to come with dirt that certi it's kind of certified that doesn't hold any relics. <laughs> and then start to plant. So planting has been a, a, something loaded with political agency. Um, I don't know where we were going with this, but I, I really wanted to say that thing. <laughs> no, it's true, and, and the comparison that you have always made is uh, the relationship between 
you as an Argentine or maybe, and the comparison between how Greeks feel having their soil beneath their feet and how this food production that you have created at the, the observatory, because I, it relates with this uh, identity. Because I'm a, I've been asked many times, and from the Archaeological Council to other people, to now that the project is, has opened, why did you plant corn? Why did you choose the specific uh, uh, species? Um, is there a political connotation? Is it So these ideas that uh, in Argentine, soil is related with something that is uh, for food production, something that's a commodity of exchange, a political commodity, it's trade. Yeah, but also it's, it's us here, <clears throat> let's say the, the interest in the Greek antiquity past is also a construction. Mm -hmm. We have received another construction. It's interesting, I was like, uh, just before coming here, went to the Byzantine Museum with my uncle. M my family from my father's side comes from Peru. So in their case, they have some, something that was happening, some, I mean, it was happening in Argentina too. They were, we had populate, I mean, natives that were doing stuff before Columbus and others came. But in his case, they had a, a big empire active. We were checking the, the collection and he comes and says, well, you know, they discovered some 30,000 BC, uh, <coughs> Paleolithic caves and paintings in, in Lima. And I'm like, yeah, of course, but again, these constructions, in our case, it's like uh, not even prehistoric life. Because of course, America, the continent, it's a construction of European bourgeoisie of 16th century. So it's, a bio, it's perhaps the biggest biopolitical experiment that ever existed. So it, it was a quite, a I, I don't have much relationship with that part of the family and all of a sudden we are talking about like our different relationships with the past. And he, he supposedly has some major past behind, but again, the construction is before Columbus, you have either Incas or Mayas or Aztecs mainly. And then there was some random people, that's it. While doing research, for this project, I went to Istanbul to the Greek neighborhood, and I met there with a, a person, a professor of a friend. Uh, this man is a, an anthropologist, and I asked him, like, uh, you know, I, I'm coming from Athens, and I cannot stop to be struck on how obsessed they are with the act of digging and preserving, and, and how difficult it is to even dig if you want to build your house or a toilet. And I, I mean, I've, I've, I've been many times to Istanbul and I was like, look here, I mean, you have a lot of past below your feet, and, but somehow seems you have a totally very dynamic and fluid relationship with it because you're basically pouring cement all over the place and constructing like crazy. It looks like Shanghai, Istanbul. Of course, this goes into so many directions, right? I'm, I'm very oversimplifying this conversation, but this man said something that I will never forget. And he's like, when we dig, we find the enemy. So we are not interested in, in whatever is below our feet. So, right, like all this, it's something we give too much for granted. Or for instance, when I was doing the Metropolitan Project, the, the toughest department to work with was the Greek and Roman department. When I did my selection of objects of the Greek and Roman department, I choose very purposely Cypriot art. The report of the department was, we will give you, I, mean, I think I, I, I had chosen something like 20 objects, they gave some 10, and they said, we want to let the artist know that this selection doesn't represent Greek and Roman department. So, again, we think these things have been resolved some hundred years and everything is fine and everything is cool, and then, you know, no. They are very active inside museums. These discussions are happening all the time. So we shouldn't forget. Actually, we have to be, be very alert on these things. It seems naive, but then this, the experience at the Metropolitan was a life-changing experience because you see people deciding. I mean, the equation, what would be the, the equation? The Metropolitan is among the three or four most powerful art institutions in the world. There's a reason why it's inside the most powerful country in the world so far. 
So there are many interpretations about these objects. We can all have like different ideas about what, what this means or that means. But truth is built up on power. So there are many, again, interpretations, but there's one truth. And that truth, the one that has the power, builds. Is this any reason why for all these three, I'm trying to connect for the audience that doesn't know why you make the connection with the Metropolitan East? No, me neither. I don't know where I made the connection, but I wanted to no. say it. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's the beginning of the projects that you called for this year, the Theatre of Disappearance. You use the same title. And uh, maybe it's because you go into these places and you dis make disappear the um, meanings that the institution bring for these specific ob objects and you put new narratives into display or interaction between them. So many people ask why you give this title to these projects. The I really like the title. Yes, I like how it sounds. Title. Yeah. Honestly, <clears throat> if I have to be very earnest, let's say there are two, this answer has, the, the very earnest answer has two answers. One is, I was looking for a title for this show, and I cannot remember the other title, but then I came with this one. And, um, and I was like, somehow my, whomever are these people, but my audience, or the field I'm operating in, is not really understanding that I'm, I've been connecting all my projects. I mean, this, first of all, is true to everyone. Yeah. We, everything we do is connected. We grow, and organically, we connect things. Even when they are disconnected, they are connected with this disconnection. So, <coughs> First of all, it's very stupid to say that I've been connecting everything. No, well. But any, anyways, I think more or less how I work is like uh, I plan things by years. So every year, let's say, there's a release of energy that, tr that generates these projects. And all the projects of that year are very severely, intricately connected in some more or less evident ways. This I said many times in different op opportunities, but somehow this message was not reaching my audience, or I, I, I would say I was not able to give agency to this message. So I did this little, uh, how can I say it, uh, little bet to myself. I said, maybe since we are such a Pavlovian species, if I titled everything the same way, people will start to ask, are you connecting the projects? And it will give me the chance, like now, to say, yes, I've been connecting all the projects. So these are the two very frank, stupid uh, answers to this. And you're connecting also materials from different projects with, when you do other projects. I mean, you, even you reuse materials, even if they're shown, let's say, inside these vitrines, you can dismantle them, take stromatolites or other stones or different things and use them for another project. So you recycle your work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is. Uh, yeah. I think. Um, let's say the, the the what 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 let's say this this audience or whomever is receiving this thing I'm doing know more about me is clay. Yeah. So clay and cement were these two materials I was mixing to conjugate all these projects and clay clay cement had this agency of like being very fragile and and, and somehow slowly the disintegrating, to put it very bluntly, right? So the, the material had a, a lifespan of its own and regulated by this material, this combination of these two materials. Later on, I actually, the things that I was already doing it, but let's say then it became more clear that I was embedding in this clay cement mix, let's say, another forms of organic material like pumpkins, apples, trunks. This actually was happening since the very beginning of my practice. But again, this is like, let's say, for the, mom the timeline since I appear in the art world up to now, this would be the time scale, right? The moment I start to incorporate these, these other materials, the objects transform themselves into what I call diachronic objects. So it, it was not only about the disintegration of this material per se, but also the appearance of other agents that were mutating and combining themselves and, ge and generating some other forms of uh, proliferation, let's say. 
So a, a good case could be a show I did in uh, one of the galleries I collaborate with, uh, uh, Curimansuto in Mexico City, where the, the objects were mainly fruits and plants and vegetables and rocks and minerals. And all these things were like rotting and smelling and sprouting and dying and decaying. So these objects were like every day transforming but not disappearing. And some of these having even been preserved and transported to other locations. So this is the moment in 2014 where I start to, to preserve some of these elements and then recycle and reincorporate in, in, in new projects. This also, this just, this like, um, I'm a hoarder, very clearly. I mean, even though many of my works disappear, also many things I retrieve and, and, and preserve. So this, uh, let's say, archive of materials many times travels with me. So I started not only to ship myself and my crew, but also to ship materials. And I found that it's quite interesting how you get into this like a gray zone for, I mean, this gray legal zone, because it's art, organic matter can travel. But only because it's art. So art generates this gray zone for many things, but let's say in this case for transportation and shipping, and allows you to have like uh, the, the rover, the vitrine that holds the, the Curiosity rover, has dirt from Morocco. It's impossible to transport dirt. Of course, it's a very active, active agent you shouldn't be transporting. But I, I think this, this um, agency of the art world and how it allows you to, to move things, it's something I'm very interested in. And also I asked you about the recycling because it's, it's very different to have a project inside the gallery or inside the museum or even within the boundaries of a very formal institution. And it's very different to go outside, be in the open space, in the public space. And I get these questions a lot, what's going to happen with this plantation? How this is related with art when we're going to um, install everything? And what's going to happen to every single item inside the vitrines? Because these are questions that this is the most frequent question that we have in the last two days that people are visited. So this is, I'm trying to give them, this is, uh, this is why I asked you the question, because I'm trying to comfort myself and the, and the audience that this is going to be recycled some way, and this is in your practice. And we're going yeah. to find sustainability mode on how this, which is called uh, a constructed art project, can be disseminated within the city in a different way. Yeah, this and is I th something we haven't thought about it in depth yet. No, no, totally. Yeah. But I think there's. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about since the press conference that we were talking about the collaboration aspects, and I, I could see how, in a way, how how well we all related to these ideas. The observatory will keep the irrigation system. They will keep the the, the soil, and it's interesting to see how once this system will be it is clearly functioning in a very healthy way, how also the observatory will have the responsibility to, to preserve it. I think there's an interesting dynamic there where you will, we will present a very functioning, very healthy system, and the institution has to take this running operating system. This, I know what you're thinking. There's nothing they, the state has to do here. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that they will have to come with any kind of extra money for anything. It's running. But I'm, I'm just saying it because I come from a country that has perhaps some similar problems with, the, let's say, the, the state and how state runs different institutions. This will be absolutely running and operating. So I think the, the, la the, the aftermath of this project is going to be very interesting to see what they can do with a tool that's in perfect state to be used. It's, it's not only up to the observatory, it's up to the Ecological Council, it's up to, oh, yes, to many, all these entities, many, that, uh, many that entities, yes. But um, the, the observatory... But we are talking about the dirt that even if you spit on it, will grow life. This is what I'm trying to say. It's not that they will have to have like hundreds of people doing something. This is an interesting aspect of the work, a political aspect. Yes, because b besides the... Um, selection of the specific plants, the way it was, uh, the whole process made, it was at the beginning, it was, you can see the photos, there were different patches of different areas within the observatory. And then we created these wooden beds, garden beds, and then we brought the soil and we planted on top. And then there was the irrigation system that was put for every plant. 
and the corn was planted inside the observatory, but the rest of the plants were um, grown, grew in nurseries, and they were transplanted in uh, the observatory. And in between, everybody was saying that uh, you have to keep distances, and you have between the roots, otherwise the plants will not survive, and you cannot put edibles together with uh, graminaceous plants. It's not going to be a sustainable plan. And this is where your artistic, I think, uh, determination came. And you defined all these codes and make such an uh, unorthodox. It came the, the Argentine stubbornness. It's funny yes. because like mo some, a big part of my crew comes from areas of uh, close to Rosario, where I live, that are in between rural and urbanized. So they have a very strong connectivity with like plantations, crops, and Noelia Ferretti, who's like was kind of the main person behind the, the planting with Juan Pablo we Mayer, she was like Adri, water, soil, seeds, sun will never fail. So this is again what I was trying to say at the beginning. Like uh, it was absolutely pure stubbornness, and we're like let's plant things all together. You no, know, uh, and all these fears, and I think it relates a lot with this uh, respect for structures, for reason, the use of reason, for that is very much Greek. This, even though the city can be incredibly <coughs> wild, there's a part of the city that, that loves these structures. Because of course, there's a past that perhaps had other structures. So we have to respect these structures and these proper ways of doing things. This happened to us from the mosaic uh, manufacturer to the plant planting nursery associates to the vitrine makers. Everybody had some fears to, to the maquette maker. Like everybody had, uh, every one of those had one tiny fear about something that should have never been done. And then two seconds later, it was totally fine. So you push the boundaries of, uh, of the maquette people, making. Of, of I'm very proud of that. Well. <laughs> Yes, 3D printing and market making is uh, what I like to push. But this is one of my favorite um, gestures you have made inside the museum because my favorite path, you, I know you don't want people to, to, to give a directions within, but it's first to go down to the war zone and then lead up and go to the silent museum and just be with the maquette of how Athens and the observatory was so many years ago. Um, this is my favorite path, but I know you want to leave people to wander and get lost, and you want this feeling for this project. Yeah, and just to say something about the museum, I think like uh, what I'm most interested about the the museum is like the fact that we we um, uh, we turn the museum into some sort of a house, let's say. Of course, it's a, it one should say it's kind of a poshy house, and it's not house I have lived in, but um, but I wanted to domesticize the space. And I wanted to erase, as I think the crops have done and the, all the planting has done, to erase the politics of the space. The, the curtains are related to a project I did two years ago in another gallery I collaborate with called Marian Goodman in New York. And the, the curtains were serving a very similar purpose. Um, I'm a person that do not like to interact much with other people. And when I'm like having some sort of art or slash cultural whatever experience, I don't like people observing me observe something or experience something. So I had a, very, a big problem with the gallery in New York because the, the gallery has this, it's a beautiful gallery, but it has this, this counter with this very cute man that every time someone comes, it's like, hi, good afternoon, good morning, Marin Goodman. And I was like, these are the politics of the gallery appearing in front of you. These are the, the, the politics of the space saying that you're in a gallery, you're watching some art, and this cute blonde kid will watch you watch things. So I had the same problem here, where I felt the museum was too present. The labels, the museology was too present. So I wanted to erase these uh, parameters, these constructed parameters, right? And. Um, this is, this is something I'm quite happy about what happened with that space. It's now silent. I felt it was very noisy. But I think you succeeded this uh, house home feeling because before we entered this uh, discussion, there was this 
young girl that came and told you that it felt like your like a house. Yeah. She was uh, a little girl. seven or eight years, and she came and said, "I love the museum. It's like my house somehow." <laughs> so this I think is it a, another excellent compliment. compliment. Yes, we are doing very well with our <laughs> audience. I think we should we can open the questions to the public. If there are questions, if not, don't worry. It's fine. Yes. I'm a goldsmith. Well, that means I work with the jewelry. <coughs> also, I'm a, an artist. So uh, the question is about uh, the Nikki of Samothraki. What means for you? And if you know exactly the story of this sculpture? I, I, I mean, I know some parts of the history of this sculpture. What it means to me? The history of this sculpture, to know everyone, that it's a um, it's an offer to this uh, island, Samothraki, that in Samothraki they make mysteries. Uh, we don't know exactly what is mystery. We don't know the links. We have lost the links. It's some kind of celebration, let's say. It's a part of a, a ship. It's the front yes. part of the ship. Uh -huh. So, uh, of course, there are uh, of course, there are others, uh, Nikes. There are many Nikes. Mm -hmm. the, no, the name Niki of Samothraki is because this is in Samothraki. Uh, what means for you this sculpture? Well, first of all, what I wanted is to, to have a replica of the sculpture. I didn't want to create something that looked like the real thing. I wanted to look, that thing to look like something you find sometimes in art schools or in shabby old museums. M honestly, my interest with the sculpture, besides the story of, or history of the sculpture, was I wanted this to look first done in plaster. So I wanted it to look like a, a replica. I didn't want this thing to look like the, the thing. And I wanted it to be as active as I've seen these replicas of this sculpture in many schools. You know, like the sc schools in Argentina, universities and high schools, the public schools have center for students. These centers for students are very highly politicized. In, in, this is in my country. It's very normal. You get into law school, art school, and you see like posters and banners with different like the different like uh, agencies or, or wings that work in this. I mean, in this center for students, and many times they take over the replicas of the sculptures. They graffiti, they paste posters again. And then they turn these like very sacred objects, objects for studies, because also pl plaster copies had this very interesting, interesting history, right? Like, I mean, the plaster copies, there was a time where you would go to, if you were like a, let's say, legal, le legally assumed as a professional handcraft plaster mold maker, you could go to the Louvre, you could go to all these archival museums and do copies. And all, and it was in late 19th, 19th century, there was this law that enabled all these handcraft men and women to do these molds of these, the most sacred, most important items. Because these plaster copies were accepted as quite valuable art artifacts. So they were means for study. Now we assume them as cheesy, ugly replicas. So anyhow, <coughs> what I was interested in, uh, or why I placed this object, was first, of course, has, it's, it's very loaded with meaning. It's very dear to the culture of Greece. But I wanted it to be a much more relatable object, not a sacred object. So that's the, the, the first layer of the, the meaning behind why I used that, that object. Which, uh, and the other one, it's mixed with these stones called stromatolites which are fossilized bacteria, very old bacteria, perhaps some of the first life forms that we have like some material recording of. Anyhow, I'm, I'm perhaps in, the, in this case, I'm not that interested in the science behind where these stones come from, but I was interested in setting the, the Nik Niki in some sort of a extraterrestrial landscape. So I, I was interested in this like displacement of the Niki as this very valuable object, then with this layer, this patina of 
the public space, let's say, but then the, the other layer of its placement in some sort of a other planetary landscape, extraterrestrial landscape, more or less. But it's interesting, what, now that you're saying this thing, when, when the Second World War, the Metropolitan has a plaster copy of the Niki. And they placed the Niki as a, let's say, memorial in, I don't know if you've been to the, to the Met, but they have this very long staircase that leads to the first floor. And they place it, let's say, at the end of this staircase in a very similar way to how the Louvre has it. So, so it's, it's interesting how the, the, the Nikki has like this agency, as you said. And I'm very interested in the plaster copies. Like again, to, sorry for going back to the Met, but the Met I think feels, connects so well with this project. Think about the Metropolitan Museum in 18, 1860 something, opening its doors with only plaster replicas. The museum was only plaster replicas. And this nation, as the power of the nation, the, the economical, political power of that nation grew, the US, <laughs> they replaced each one of these, most of these copies, these plaster copies, for the original objects. So all these things were things I was like trying to play with and, and connect while using that, 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 that item. And you, you planned all the, the uh, corn and stuff, and uh, you have a green thumb, so they grew perfect and uh, very beautiful. So um, they bring out fruit, they bring out seeds. Uh, do you take some of these seeds maybe for another project because they have done their best here? <laughs> We. It's true, we took some seeds for, and then we placed them in, the, in one of the vitrines over there. But it's a good idea, I never thought about it. Yes, maybe, maybe I should take some seeds. It's true. No, I didn't, didn't think about it, but good one. Thank you. <laughs> Are you going to carry seeds and everything around? <laughs> I've done it, but this, yeah. this time I never thought about it. But yes, it's a good idea. I think we have uh, still 45 minutes that Whoever hasn't seen the, not 45 minutes for you to talk, but 45 <laughs> minutes for everyone who hasn't seen the exhibition to go and visit the place. The exhibition will be open until the 24th of September. It's open from Wednesday to Sunday from 11 to 9. It's only with natural light. So I think the best time of the day is maybe in the afternoon or when it's quite dark, uh, quite hot. And uh, we have a group of people that's going to host you here, uh, some wonderful people that are going to find them inside, headed by two of our colleagues, Dosi Ornanido and Nikes Fragul uh, Kokinos. And we hope that you return again and again and you tell it to your friends. And because this project is organic, it's, it's going to, in two days, it has changed. The corn has grown 20 centimeters. For us, it's uh, you know, a process every time we come. Before we open, there's, um, you can see this in the photos. Over there, there's the sculpture of Aginitis, which is one of the first uh, directors. You could see it four or five days ago. You could see the head still. Now it's gone. It's completely disappeared. So the theater disappearance continues through nature in this project. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming.